Ich möchte unseren Künstlern recht herzlich danken für ihre musikalische Einleitung unserer Konferenz zur Würdigung des großen deutsch-amerikanischen Raumfahrtpioniers Dr. Kraft Erike. Und Sie kommen ja aus drei verschiedenen Ländern, aber wie Sie alle hören konnten, hat die Musik nicht nur Sie geeint, sondern uns alle hier im Raum. Und für Dr. Kraft Erike war die Raumfahrt etwas Ähnliches. Er sah darin eben auch eine eigene Kraft, mit der die Menschheit zusammengeführt werden kann, um die wirklichen Probleme der Menschheit zu lösen. Ich begrüße Sie jetzt noch mal recht herzlich hier und mein Dank gilt allen denen, die hierher gekommen sind, um Dr. Kraft Erike zu würdigen. Weil ihm ist es zu verdanken, dass die USA mit dem Apollo-Projekt die ersten waren, die zum Mond gekommen sind. Neil Armstrong erklärte aber diesen Schritt auf dem Mond für einen großen Schritt, nicht nur für ihn und die USA, sondern für die gesamte Menschheit. Wie aber danken es unsere Regierung und Institutionen wie das Deutsche Museum diesem Mann, der diesen Schritt entscheidend mit möglich gemacht hat. Die heutige Veranstaltung hätte eigentlich im Ehrensaal des Deutschen Museums stattfinden sollen. Wir waren sogar bereit, den Saal zu mieten. Das Museum, vertreten durch ihren Generaldirektor, hat dies abgelehnt. Unsere erste Referentin, Marsha Freeman, aus den USA, hat bei ihren Recherchen zu ihrem Buch über die Rolle der Deutschen in der Geschichte der Raumfahrt persönlich den Generaldirektor Professor Heckel auf die Abwesenheit von Büsten von Werner von Braun und Kraft Erige im Ehrensaal des Deutschen Museums angesprochen. Seine Antwort, warum man diese dort nicht findet, lautete, sie haben für die Nazis gearbeitet. Dr. Kraft Ehrige war 1933, als Hitler an die Macht kam, gerade 15 Jahre alt. Was macht nun das Deutsche Museum dieses Jahr statt der Ehrung von Dr. Kraft Ehrige? Man organisiert eine Ausstellung Energiewenden, in der die Jugend für Techniken des Mittelalters gewonnen werden soll. Die Windmühlen sind aber nicht verschwunden, weil es keinen Wind mehr auf der Erde gibt, sondern weil sie durch bessere Techniken mit höheren Energieflussdichten ersetzt wurden. Wir wollen uns heute aber nicht mit den ewigen Gestrigen beschäftigen, sondern mit Visionären wie Dr. Kraft Erige. Außerdem soll das Beispiel China zeigen, dass die Visionen der ersten Raumfahrtpioniere heute wieder weiter verfolgt werden. China ist das Land, das heute die meisten Raketenstarts im Jahr durchführt und die Vision von Dr. Kraft Erige der Industrialisierung des Mondes umsetzen will. China ist aber auch das Land, das mit seiner Politik der neuen Seidenstraße für eine Zusammenarbeit auch hier auf Erden steht. Deutschland sollte sich auch daran beteiligen. Wir müssen endlich das alte Paradigma der Grenzen des Wachstums ersetzen und die Jugend 
herausfordern, Grenzen zu überwinden. Weil das macht den Menschen wieder zum schöpferischen Abbild Gottes und wird auch das Ende der Kriege bedeuten. Besonders möchte ich heute hier die Halbschwester von Dr. Kraft Erige, Christiane Erige, unter uns begrüßen. Außerdem hoffe ich, dass zwei Schüler anwesend sind von dem Klenze-Gymnasium hier aus München, weil 1981 hatte dort Dr. Kraft Erige vor Hunderten von Schülern über sein Projekt äh, des Mondes als siebten Kontinent der Erde gesprochen und dass der Mond der Ausgangspunkt ist für die wirkliche Eroberung unseres Sonnensystems. Natürlich begrüße ich auch hier heute Helga Zeppler-Rusch, die Präsidentin des Internationalen Schiller-Instituts, die heute Nachmittag mit Ihnen sprechen wird. Sie hat uns aber noch jemanden mitgebracht, ihren Ehemann Lünden LaRouche, wofür ich ihr besonders danken will. Er ist wie Dr. Kraft Erike ein Visionär und noch jung gebliebener Revolutionär. Durch ihn sind viele hier im Saal inspiriert worden. Lündner Rouge war bereits 1983 hier in München. Damals stellte er im Deutschen Museum Regens SDI-Programm vor, das er entscheidend mitkonzipiert hatte. La Rouge erkannte damals das Potenzial des Großraums München mit seinen wissenschaftlichen Instituten in der Kernfusionsforschung in Garching und der Luft- und Raumfahrtindustrie, für die damals vor allem MBB stand, zur Lösung der Probleme der Menschheit hier auf Erden. 2008 war er nochmal in München, um die Münchner für den Bau des Transrapid hier in München zu gewinnen. Beide Projekte wurden leider nicht realisiert. Aber jetzt gibt es mit der Wahl von Donald Trump in den USA eine Chance, dass sich die USA nicht gegen das neue Paradigma der neuen Seidenstraße stellen und Teil der Lösung der Probleme der Menschheit werden. Ich möchte auch noch danken Martin Henning, der seine Gemälde dort hinten platziert hat. Und sein Wunsch ist es, dass diese Gemälde einen wichtigen Bestimmungsort finden, nämlich in einem Foyer einer Firma oder Institution, die eng mit der Raumfahrt zusammenhängt und dadurch eben auch Menschen für die Raumfahrt durch die Kunst inspiriert werden. Wir kommen jetzt zu den heutigen Reden. Und ich möchte gern unsere erste Referentin, Marsha Friemann, hier auf das Podium bitten, die nicht nur die beste Biografie über Dr. Kraft Erige geschrieben hat, sondern auch zu seinen Freundinnen gehörte. Sie kennt sehr gut die Familie die Töchter von Kraft Erige und wir werden da sicher einiges erfahren. Sie hat aber auch mit ihrem Buch Hin zu neuen Welten das Buch zur Geschichte der deutschen Raumfahrtpioniere geschrieben. Sie haben alle beim Eintritt ein Exemplar bekommen und können es sich am Ende der Konferenz von ihr signieren lassen. Ich möchte dich ans Podium bitten. Good morning. Uh, we are here for uh, a wonderful anniversary today. For the yesterday would have been the 100th birthday of Kraft Erika. He was born 100 years ago in Berlin, and as a child was very precocious, very bright, and very interested in mathematics, in science, and astronomy. And at the age of 12, he went to a movie theater in Berlin and saw a film that would change his life. This was Frau im Mond, the, the film, the movie that Hermann Obert had been an advisor on with a fantastic and unbelievably technically uh, visionary view of mankind's moon mission. Uh, it was a really at that time that Kraft Erika decided that this is what he would do with his life, would be to do the work to bring that vision into being. Uh, during the war, he was drafted into the German army, but he was very fortunate. He had filed two patents for new inventions in rocketry before the war. 
And so he was brought from the Eastern Front to Pinamunda and worked on the A-4, which became the V-2 rocket. So he was there in October of 1942 when the first man-made object reached the inner limits, just the edge of space. So at that time, uh, it really had become very clear that the technology would be developed. There was no doubt mankind would master the technology to go into space. After the war, he came to the United States, uh, worked for a little while with the team led by Werner von Braun in Huntsville. They were designing a rocket that eventually would be the Saturn V to take man to the moon. But Kraft was always looking into the future. Uh, he was very confident that people would develop the technology. This would just be a matter of time. His concern was what we would be doing 50 years, 100 years, and most importantly, what was the reason? Why should we be going into space? In 1957, just a few months before the Soviet Union launched Sputnik and opened the space age, Kraft Erika wrote an article with a centerpiece was these three laws. He called them the three laws, the fundamental laws of astronautics. And this really was his philosophical framework. All right, not the technical details, not how to build a rocket, but the reasons why man should be going into space and the framework, the philosophical, the moral framework of what should guide him. So these were the three laws before the age of Sputnik. Nobody and nothing under the natural laws of this universe impose any limitations on man except man himself. And he could see 40 years in advance that the idea that man has no limits that would be challenged. And of course, we saw that in the 1960s. Limits to growth uh, came popular but he could see in 1957 that you had to assert that there were no limits to man except man himself. Not only the Earth, but the entire solar system. And as much of the universe as he could reach under the laws of nature are man's rightful field of activity. Right? So we are certainly not limited to the Earth or even the space near the Earth, but the entire universe should be what we are exploring. And most importantly, by expanding through the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. All right, so that this was not just a technical question, but a question of what is the nobility of man? What is the morality? that mankind has. He described, uh, and I'm just going to read a, a few quotes from him, why this was important. Why, why is space what embodies these three laws? Why not something else? He says, the concept of space travel carries with it enormous impact because it challenges man on practically all fronts of his physical and spiritual existence. The idea of traveling to other celestial bodies reflects the highest degree of independence and agility of the human mind. It lends ultimate dignity to man's technical and scientific endeavors, and above all, it touches on the philosophy of his very existence. This is not the way space travel is discussed very much today, but this is the framework <clears throat> within with which <clears throat> excuse me, he saw the space age and its importance. In the 1930s, when he was just in his 20s, Kraft Erika started writing. And he started writing 
compositions and articles and papers that started in the future. Uh, in the 1930s, he wrote a piece that he just simply called To My Loving Mother. And it is about, again, this is in the 1930s. It's a story that starts in 1991 and recounts the voyage of a, a uh, exploration mission to Venus. So this is 1991. No one, uh, of course, knew what Venus was like, but he could imagine in his mind a scientific delegation, the crew, the maintenance people, but the astronomers, the scientists, uh, maybe even biologists, people at that time thought there might be life on Venus. In 1948, he wrote something. Uh, we can, I think, have the next. Really quite extraordinary. Uh, this was written in English. This is 1948. This is one year after he came to the United States. One year. Uh, and the German space pioneers who came over after World War II, were learning English by watching cowboy movies uh, and sharing, 100 people sharing one English dictionary. But in 1948, he wrote this beautiful piece that you see on the screen, Expedition Ares. This starts 400 years in the future. Then looking back, what has happened over the the 400 preceding years. And of course, he has uh, visited all of the planets 400 years from now. Man has been and landed on all of the planets in the solar system. But he says, in the year 2000 is Expedition Ares, the first mission to, manned mission to Mars. Uh, this is not entirely successful mission. They have all kinds of problems, encounters with asteroids. Uh, it's remarkable what he could envision the problems would be uh, so many years before they would actually happen. If people remember the Apollo 13 mission, where they had an explosion on the way to the moon and we had to get them back, he has that kind of incident all kinds of catastrophes, uh, semi-catastrophes along the way. And uh, he says, well, the first manned mission to Mars was not a success, but onwards. So again, this is 1948. Okay. What he was able to envision through the 19, late 1940s and then 1950s was the full array of activities that space technology would open up to man. And if this is, I know, a little complicated, but in the 1960s, he put together this graph to show the different areas of science, technology, uh, benefit to society, just from a very general standpoint. And you can see exploration lunar, because certainly we're going to go to the moon first, and then the entire solar system. Uh, you can see in the science areas, every branch of science, astronomy, of course, and space physics, but also chemistry and life sciences. So again, he was mapping in his mind and then putting forward for the space community what the potential of exploration should be, all the way from the very practical applications from Earth orbit, like what we have today, communications, all the way to exploration of the solar system. Okay, thank you. Venus, always very intriguing. Before we sent spacecraft out there, we really didn't know what Venus was like. And in 1955, Kraft Erika gave a lecture, as you can see him, uh, in Copenhagen. This was at an international space conference. So he was already at that time mapping out exploration of the solar system. In Earth orbit, I just picked a couple of examples. This is a very charming one. This is a, a television interview 
that he did in 1966. Uh, he is showing Walter Cronkite, who was a major uh, CBS television commentator uh, from the very first NASA launch to practically the last one. Everyone in the United States knew Walter Cronkite. And here Kraft is showing him what an orbiting hospital could look like. That there would be a lot of benefits to people with different illnesses in microgravity. People with heart problems, uh, burn victims, uh, you know, osteoporosis, various uh, joint diseases, would really have a much easier time without this force of gravity that we all live with here. So he, again, was really looking at the whole array. Well, by the late 1960s, things in many places, and definitely in the United States, were changing. The, cul the, the culture was changing. The counterculture was coming in. The green movement, which at that point was the zero growth movement, propositions that mankind was limited, his thinking was limited, his resources were limited, and Kraft, Erica, was determined to intervene in this very destructive philosophical approach. And in 1971, he developed a picture for a concept, which he became very well known for, the extraterrestrial imperative. And what he was saying was, Space exploration is not just a nice thing. It's not just a mission to here, a mission to there, or developing technology. He said it's absolutely imperative. This is something we must do. In 1973, 71, 72, 73, he had written a book called The Extraterrestrial Imperative. And I just wanted to read a little bit of a foreword that he wrote for that book because I think it encapsulates his philosophical approach. He says, a balanced attitude toward technology and industry, environment and ecology is essential to our mental and spiritual development, hence vital to the preservation of our future. Otherwise, jungle, and wilderness inside the mind and outside will regain their stranglehold on humanity. As starvation, disease, and depopulation stalk the earth, and the will to grow dies. Right? This was the alternative to the extraterrestrial imperative. Even with stagnant technology and industry, m misery and poverty will en en engulf mankind. There's nothing such as stasis that you can have stagnation. Dedication to bare survival will destroy our social achievements, force nations, groups, and individuals into hostile isolation and shatter our civilization. This may start to sound familiar to us, this is a time to outgrow the parochial carryovers from past civilizations and intervening dark ages that burden the philosophy of our society and the recurring fear to grow. This is a time with our growing world that has expanded beyond planetary dimensions to grow with our growing knowledge and our growing responsibilities which is the moral aspect. He says, earth and world are no longer synonyms. We no longer lived in a closed world of one planet inside the womb of a biosphere. We must distinguish between what is uniquely terrestrial and what does not require the earth. Our world is more, no more closed than it is flat. Our world is open to space, and its resources therewith are potentially limitless. Okay. And this is, I know this is very impossible to read, but for his extraterrestrial imperative book, Kraft Erica 
mapped it out for us. At the top half of the screen are what he sees as the consequences or the opportunities if there is growth. If we have a space program that takes us outside of the Earth to take advantage of all of the resources and the scientific breakthroughs awaiting us in our space exploration and development, uh, just to mention a couple, of course, we'll have developments in technology and science, international cooperation, uh, you know, a limitless future, extraterrestrial industrialization, which I'll, I'll show you what that looks like, and a future for mankind outside of the Earth into the universe. Now, the second half, the bottom half of the diagram, are the consequences of what will happen to mankind if we don't have an open world, if we don't see space as our frontier to develop. And it's, it's again, thinking of what the world looks like today. This is very prescient for him in 1971 to be able to see what the limits to growth and the closed world would lead to. Just to, to mention a couple of the things on the chart. Geopolitics, extreme poverty, mass starvation, wars, possibly nuclear war, social revolutions, ecological crises, and that the population would become death-oriented. I mean, could you have a better description of what we're facing today? So this is why he really, you know, devoted almost 20 years of his life to promoting the extraterrestrial imperative and speaking and doing television interviews and, uh, you know, lectures at universities to really try to counter what was happening in the 60s and through the 70s and to put mankind on a positive path. One of the questions I, I just wanted to quickly address is it's something that our organizers and, and people encounter talking to people in aerospace or just people that you meet at a post office about Kraft Erica. And while it's true that he passed away many years ago, very young, in 1984, uh, people have not heard of him. They have heard of Werner von Braun, I hope so. Certainly in the United States, he is a, a household world, word. People know, you know that he was leading the development of the rocket that took mankind, took Americans to the moon. And Kraft Erika knew Werner von Braun. This is a photograph of both of them together uh, with von Braun on the left, well, on your right, uh, and Kraft. Uh, why didn't Kraft Erika's name become a household word? Living by his own philosophy of the moral imperative of space exploration, Kraft Erika never compromised. He never bowed to any pressure of what was popular. And nuclear energy, space exploration, developing fusion power, uh, saying that there were no limits to growth, by the late 1960s, this was not popular. He was not going to change, and he was not going to compromise. And therefore, uh, you know, by the late 1960s, he was not popular, he was not on television, he was not really before a large section of the American public, right? So, and, and there have been criticisms of him by other scientists saying, well, you know, he, he, well, he did the wrong thing. He would have been popular if he had been willing to compromise. And then we would not be celebrating Kraft Erika's birthday today because he would have been not important in history. But, you know, it is something that we come up against in organizing, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, a wonderful tour of Germany, and I think you can see, I hope you can see enough 
of people's expression. You have Helga LaRouche and Kraft Erika on tour in November of 1981 in Germany, uh, speaking at universities and giving lectures, uh, here talking to members of the European Labour Party. And this was, uh, you know, really a way to bring his philosophy, his thinking, uh, to Germany, where he started out. But his trip to Germany was very disturbing to him, and I'm sure to Helga LaRouche as well, because again, the political environment had changed. Right? You had the anti-nuclear movement, you had the Greens running rampant here, also in the United States, shutting down nuclear plants, uh, resorting to violence when they thought that that would help them make their point. And this is a photograph of, of me talking to Kraft Erika before his presentation in New York City when he returned from his trip to Germany. And I think you can see uh, from the expression on his face, he's relating a very unhappy, uh, disturbing experience. Uh, he opened his presentation on the extraterrestrial imperative, and I just want to read a quote because the way he said it is most important. He said, it is a little bit disconcerting that the same shock troop kind of tactics stand at the end of one's life as I have seen as a young man in Berlin in 1929, 1930, and 1931 right, the shock troops in the street. He continued, the youth of West Germany and other nations have unfortunately been greatly misled. Today, if a person even talks about space flight or nuclear energy, then the echopaths, the cultural pessimists, literally characterize this to be a provocation and they do their utmost to prevent it. The police had to be called to prevent violence when students at a university venue tried to bar the speakers from entry, himself and Helga LaRouche. So you can imagine what kind of impact and effect this has. I and mean, he says, let's just take, for the sake of argument, let's just imagine that the view that the Greens have of limits to growth, let's say that that is correct. Are we thus to suffer indefinitely because technology could be misused? And then he says, in 1979, of all things, in the year of the child of the United Nations, there were 12 million children who did not reach their first birthday. That's 50% more than all of the battle deaths in World War I. That is to say nothing of the suffering of those children before they died and, not, and the suffering of the mothers who bore those children just to see them die and not be able to, to feed them, to hear them cry day and night. This is unbelievable agony. So this was the way he framed the importance, juxtaposition, uh, juxtaposing what the consequences would be if you followed what the Greens were proposing. No technology, limits to, to growth, zero population, as compared to what the potential of mankind could be. Uh, the next one. Well, to get to his 50 years in the future, he developed a, a remarkably detailed and very beautiful picture of what the first steps had to be. And this was the industrial development of the moon. He described the lunar development as the extraterrestrialization of the human species. 
This would be our first step off the planet Earth to, to create a new civilization. And I'm just going to show a few pictures that he, many of them, and I'll uh, indicate, he painted himself. Uh, it's nice to have paintings here in the conference room. Kraft Erika had the talent to not only develop the concepts, but also to visualize them. And so many of the paintings, this is one of his paintings. This is preparing runways on the moon for vehicles that would be coming to deliver supplies and crew. Next one. This is what he called a slide lander, which was an entirely new kind of vehicle. You had no atmosphere. The vehicles coming to the moon were not going to be airplanes, you know, that could land with wings. So he developed a whole new science to use the sand, the loose dirt on the moon, to be able to, to, land, to slow down and land vehicles, okay? The industrial development of the moon would absolutely take advantage of having nuclear energy. And again, I know this is hard to see, but these are his sketch sketches of underground lunar mining. The moon has many materials that are useful, certainly oxygen, uh, rare metals, uh, titanium, uh, alumina. So you would want to mine the moon, certainly. And you could do this in underground caverns, which is what he's pictured here, where you would have shaped nuclear charges, fission charges going off. And you would have the heat and the radiation to separate into constituent elements the soil that you would be throwing in the cavity. So this would be underground nuclear mining. You would have a transportation system that initially would be taking material components, habitats from the Earth to the moon as you were setting up the civilization there. Later, you would be taking the minerals and materials you were producing on the moon and probably bringing them not back to the Earth's surface, but certainly to Earth's orbit, and later to Mars and wherever else you were going in the solar system. Again, nuclear, this is a nuclear-powered freighter uh, that Kraft Erika himself painted. Today, people talk about going to the moon and sending two people uh, a little habitat uh, a little uh, igloo for them to live in. Uh, that was not Kraft Erika's picture of a city on the moon. Uh, this is Selenopolis. His, this is a city with hundreds of thousands of people. This is not a few people, you know, crouching in closed quarters, huddling together, as being, which is what's being proposed today. This is powered by fusion energy. You see on the left, Tokamax under construction. You can see, I hope you can see it. It's probably too light. Well, under the dome is the city, of course. And then you have a magnetically levitated transportation system. Hard to see, but going around the outside of the city. And I want to show you what the inside would look like. This is summer in Selenopolis. Again, this is not going to be a few people, uh, you know, living in a tent. This is going to be like cities on Earth. And it will replicate what people need, even for recreation. These are people relaxing after a tennis game uh, and uh, living life, doing their scientific work, putting on spacesuits, going out exploring, supervising the mining operations, but they also need to relax. And the, the last one of Salonopolis is winter and an ice skating rink. Uh, you see on one side, uh, on the left side is a building which is the Hall of Astronauts. You're going to have museums, concert halls, 
in addition, in the far distance is your garden. This is where your food is grown, your crops. So you have many different kinds of environments, weather systems, uh, climate. So the moon would be the first step. This would be your extraterrestrial foothold. It will be your manufacturing center to be able to send people out to the rest of the solar system. You're also going to be developing, not just on the moon, but even in Earth orbit, the capability to do that. Now, this is a, uh, a drawing. It's also hard to see. It's just a black and white line drawing that he did. And this he called Astropolis. Again, the opolis meaning a city, the astro being in space. This would be an, a city in space orbiting the Earth. We know what the International Space Station looks like today, and it, it's a pretty good size. You know, weighs a million pounds. Uh, can accommodate seven astronauts. But this is not a space station. This is a city in space, again, with hundreds of thousands of people. And this would be uh, the largest Earth orbiting system. And it would be, uh, I just want to read for uh, to one minute his description of Astropolis. A new branch of psychology exopsychology and of sociology, exosociology will evolve because this is going to be a self-sufficient city. The transition to life be beyond Earth is very profound. Nobody can predict at this time what the ultimate outcome of the adjustments will be in what may be the greatest socio-psychological challenge faced in human history. He said that, oh, well, uh, the things that will be contained here uh, will be, of course, living accommodations, uh, growing food, and other things that you need. Also, a space university. Really, the first step towards separation from Earth. And he says the space university is organized for extensive and long-term utilization of the orbital environment for basic and applied research. On Earth, university laboratories can st simulate many environments, but they cannot simulate subterrestrial or zero gravity conditions. So you will have the university in orbit to be able to start to simulate for people what it will be like to go out and to live off the Earth. And this, of course, Astropolis will be built when lunar industrialization is already underway. So some of the materials that you will use to build Astropolis will come from the moon. Okay. <coughs> and finally, what is the end point here? for mankind to develop another Earth. If you look at the comparative size between the Earth and what he called an astro cell, they're really about the same size. So this is a duplication, if you will, a duplicate of the Earth with all of the same facilities, resources, but it's not a station that's going to stay in orbit around the Earth. It is going to finally cut the bounds of Earth with a propulsion system, and it's just going to go off on its own. This is a, really a very challenging concept. Um, he says, Androcells will be spun off from the mother planet as a self-sufficient society, no longer tied to the Earth, or even to the moon, but free to travel the solar system. He says it's mobile, seeks other resources, it's going to visit all the other planets, and finally man will have cut the umbilical cord to Earth. So this was the final 
And of course, nothing would limit you either to the solar system. If you have your own fusion propulsion system, you can actually gather the fuel, the helium, the oxygen, what you need for the rocket propulsion, the fusion propulsion system, you can do that on your travels and just go. So this would be the evolution that you would see. And then he says he envisions this process as the outlook for the evolution of the universe in the next 30 billion years. Right? That once man is free to, to just go, Mankind will determine the evolution of the universe for 30 billion years. And last... Okay. This is just very simply a summary uh, of the, the whole picture. All right, starting from the left-hand side with the lunar materials processing, manufacturing, extraterrestrialization, going up from there to, to Astropolis in the center, this huge city in Earth orbit, then going on the left up to Selenopolis, the city on the moon, lunar colonization, then the Androcell, the Androcell is free to go to Mars. He has a Mars Androcell, an asteroid belt, a Jovian, right, to Jupiter, and you're just free to go. I just want to finish with one very beautiful quote, which I know was a challenge to translate into German. Um, well, it's poetry, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, at the time of his death, Kraft Erika had been working very intensively for the previous 10 years through the 70s, and he passed away in 1984 and was ill for that whole previous year. So for 10 years, uh, uh, the, towards the end of his life, he was working intensively on the lunar industrialization because these were the steps he really was actively uh, promoting to be uh, implemented right away. There was no reason to wait to do it. And he wrote a book called The Seventh Continent, The Industrialization and Settlement of the Moon. And he describes the moon as the prime model of developing a new world at the outset of androspheric expansion. He says for several, there are several reasons why you would do that. He says the moon is our partner in this double planet system, only two and a half to three flight days away. Less time that it takes an oil tanker to get from the Persian Gulf to New England. The moon is a potential source of raw materials and a suitable place for materials processing and for establishing the first extraterrestrial biosphere. The surface area almost equals that of the Americas, which lends itself enough gravity for human comfort and plant growth. He also says that the moon is a new world of great beauty Selenians, those living in Selenopolis, live truly on the shores of interplanetary ocean. They will travel with ease between the one-sixth surface gravity of the moon and the weightlessness of circumlunar orbiting outposts, and later between their world and those of Mars, asteroids, and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. The Sel Sel Selenians indeed live in a cosmic cosmically open world. I see a polyglobal, three-dimensional civilization. In retrospect, its foundations were laid in the twilight of the past millennium. 
by those who understood the magnificent call of the extraterrestrial imperative. But there were some among them who did not have the capacity for understanding that their world reaches to the stars. And so they rooted and burrowed into the ground. They regressed, whining and shouting slogans. Fearful to grow, they atrophied to a barren stump on a clump of earth and became stillbirths of the biosphere. I think we know some people who think this way. In a miserable world of stagnation, poverty, and backwardness, they may indeed manage to trigger the ultimate catastrophe of releasing, releasing nuclear energy in an entropic holocaust, but this is not preordained. Instead, the new humanity, Homo sapiens extraterrestrials, will sail on a new course into the open world of limitless growth, negentropically and steady as you go. When finally, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, who we are honored to have here today, developed a concept a number of years ago called the simultaneity of eternity. This is a, a very, very important concept, I think, for us today in this current situation. The value, the importance of Kraft Erika's work is not dependent upon what he did in the past. It is completely dependent upon what we do in the future. Now, what we do is going to define and give meaning to his work and his, really his position that he occupies in history. And, and I think that that's really, we can see, I think, very clearly the situation today. And you look at Kraft Erika's graph of what a closed world could bring the world to, and we see it all around us. And many years ago, he gave us the pathway to a different world. Thank you. Ooh.